Hello and welcome to another episode of the Respecting Your Elders podcast. <laughs> We're recording in Hollywood, California, and today my guest is Sean Humphreys. Hello! Thanks so much for doing this podcast. Right? Uh, so fun. I mean, I feel like um, uh, this is going to be the only form of communication in the future, mm-hmm. right? We're gonna, people are going to be reaching back into the early 21st century podcast and going like, what happened? What was what was going on in the world at that time before the Great Collapse? No, I don't know. Yeah, no, it feels that way. <laughs> I feel like you're the only human I'm going to see in person for the next couple months. And like by I mean, being here, you're like some sort of Mad Max figure. Warrior. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I, 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 I came through the rain, which exactly. is like, it is the hardest rain that LA has experienced. I mean, in a few weeks for sure, but yeah. it's that, that level of flooding and... Was there much traffic? No, which, I mean, I think it's a combined rain, and nobody in L.A. likes to drive in the rain, and yeah. also... The coronavirus. The pandemic, yes. Um, I wonder, what was that called when they blocked off the 405? Oh, uh... The big... Something demic. Uh, Get, what they, Get, Carmageddon? Carmageddon, there it is. I wonder what has less traffic, Carmageddon or coronavirus? Uh, whew, I don't know. So I was over at uh, Oaks. I got my coffee at Oaks. Yep. The movie Armageddon was actually playing on the fucking TV. Wow. I'm just going like, what is going on? I'm just, I'm just fanning the flames of the Those craziness. people over at the Oaks, they, they're, they're so uh, cynical. Yeah, and, a little uh, bit, ironic, they're so hipster. ironic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was. I, it, I don't know how like if somebody just put it on or there was a thought behind it. But, yeah. But also Armageddon, it's a great name for a movie that's really should be called like. Uh, oil guys in space, or you know what I mean? It's, it's like it's such a it's such the wrong name for that movie. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, it's like sounds like something that should be treated with much more depth and weight. Yeah, than Sonny Bruce Willis. Stuff. Yeah, like, exactly to, to the fucking asteroid dropping one liners. Yeah, I, well, and, and again, like maybe it is a way because I look at a lot of this stuff as like, well, maybe it is a way to diffuse some of our negative energy around the word Armageddon. We just make this high adventure oh the world's gonna end but it, they do it with so tongue-in-cheek yeah that is like makes us aerosmith well. ballad yes <laughs> well thank you again for coming braving the rain and the coronavirus and We've this is our third, what, third attempt reschedule yes i was sick the first time yeah i don't know what i had and then, i was down for the count and and i had just gotten my teeth whitened because my agent told me to oh, right. and my new agent so I have this new agent, and now I'm like down a thousand dollars. Well, okay. So I, I do I do think a lot of times that the entry level of Hollywood is like a multi level marketing scheme. Yeah, that you're at the bottom rung. Yeah, now you got to get ten people underneath you exactly. to buy your whatever right. thing that you're gonna sell, and then he the agent's got his. <laughs> yeah, my stepdad asked me if like the my agent and the dentist. Uh, are in cahoots? Yeah. Oh, uh, they're not. Well, they're not probably directly, but I would still say these are the things that drive this industry. These headshots, teeth white, classes. classes. Oh, you're gonna have an age, uh, casting director meet and greet. It's only fifty dollars, but you know it, we're you know like it's all like these little ways, especially as a performer. You guys, you guys. I don't put myself out there as a performer as much, but get hit so hard in so many different ways. I don't even know who I am anymore. Right? My hair is longer because of <laughs> headshots. Yeah. My teeth are whiter. I'm like... What? Okay. So that, there's something The product. Yes, you are. The perfect product. Oh, so, man. Right? Yeah, so let's sell some coronavirus, antiviral, antiretroviral. <laughs> I just... Uh, I, I tweeted, like, mass tweeted about the coronavirus. You just were like I said like I said it. like uh, yeah exactly yeah. Um, which I think gets people to fo- unfollow you when they go on Twitter and they, you have like 10 posts in a row <laughs> I, mean, I know I'm super blocked on Facebook so I don't care anymore yeah so, I love your posts on Facebook I'm a crazy person on they're the very funny yeah. um, so I posted like you know I when I saw the NBA season was canceled I posted that uh, like the Gryffindor World Cup was canceled, <laughs> and dodgeball is canceled mm-hmm. with like ben, uh, what's his name Ben Stiller. Uh, yeah, not that those are that funny, but no, but you, it's almost like Rolodexing, like what we do in improv. You like go through this, go through, and then maybe one of them, maybe one out of ten Spit is the one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Thunderdome. I said it was canceled. Oh yeah, fuck, this is 
Oof. And uh, my dad messaged me saying, too soon. <laughs> Not funny. You should uh, take it down. Well, I would say on some level. You know what I said? Uh, okay, boomer. Uh, I mean, well, yes. I felt bad, but it just seemed like the perfect situation. No, that's the, I will say that's true. Because on some level, not your dad directly, but that generation is putting us a little bit in this crisis that we're in right now. So you can tell me it's too soon or maybe it's too late. Maybe it's... I think I wrote OK Boomer because it was easier than... I mean, I think Go, first, it, was a, it was a it was a it was just an instant reaction, you yeah. know? But also, there's like 10 different reasons why I could argue why humor might be exactly the a worthwhile of, thing right yeah. now. And also that I was joking about things being canceled, not the actual virus itself. Or people dying of it, or people being negatively impacted by it. I didn't want to get into like a big Facebook messenger mm -hmm. argument at one in the morning. I, I will say, is he, is he, uh, okay, so the only person that's allowed to give me notes is somebody paying me. Is he paying you? No. <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. I, I'm not taking your notes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Great. Fine. You know. <laughs> and I'm sure I have like a lot of baggage of like years of being told, finish your food, wash your hair. Yes. So, well, yeah. It's your chance to stand up for yourself. Sure, you know, push this my buttons. Well, okay, let me ask. Because I have... I've had complicated relationships with my parents. How do you get along? Do you get along with them okay? Yeah, we do get oh, along. Okay, so this is almost could be seen as good fatherly advice. Could be. But he's maybe pushing... The, he's, he's watching out for your safety. He's not being passive-aggressive. I, I don't know. Okay. Maybe he felt like he was being a good father yeah. by... Yeah, protect, he's trying to protect you on some level. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you know, whenever my mom would give me advice, I'd have to, like, step back and go, like, wait a second, is there some kind of sabotage going on? Right. Here? You know, okay. personally. Yeah. But, I mean, also... Maybe he was thinking he's worried about what other people, other people being upset at me or... Yeah, for sure. I mean, he, he, was being, he, was, he was actually being a good dad. And I would say from what I know of you... It seems like you were raised by good people. You're because you're a kind, warm person. Thanks. So it, I think that stuff gets passed along. You know what I mean? So yeah. I would I've automatically thought that there was any animosity between you, you and your dad. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, you there is potential for it. You know, well, I mean, we got to take down the silver bags. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's wait? The name of the podcast is respecting your elders. Uh, <laughs> I failed. <laughs> Actually, I wrote OK Boomer and he wrote Disrespectful. Ah, nice. He, does he watch or listen to your... Then we message some more. Yeah, he'll probably watch and listen. Okay. Ah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if he will or not. He's, he's, he's supportive but not creepy. No, not creepy. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> um, it's, it's funny, respecting your elders, I am older than you. I am could be 50 this year which is crazy you don't look it i know uh but it, it, and then i mean for the cameras yeah you know, right yeah i wanted to ask Fuck you yeah. about that at some point uh my uh open heart surgery and uh radical nephrectomy scar that looks like a mercedes-benz symbol on my chest just saying it not for the people on the the camera but the people on the mic yeah 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 um yeah it's uh, just a little open heart surgery just a little no open heart surgery. What, whatever we'll get through it just like we'll get through the corona yeah yeah um yeah i got diagnosed kind of around last july with a tumor in my kidney oh, wow. then as you get more imaging and they kind of look at it more it became okay we're gonna have to take out the kidney because it's the, the tumor is taking it over then they're like oh wait a second the tumor has left the kidney and it's going up uh to it's the ivc the in inferior vena cava uh so at that point i was having surgeons go oh this is not a surgery i can perform you have to go to UCLA, U, U, USC, or mm -hmm. Loyola, mm -hmm. where they have these big medical centers. And uh, that was December 17th. Where did you go? UCLA. And everything's okay now? Everything's okay now. I'm actually, yeah, so I had the tumor removed, or, no, the kidney removed with the tumor in it, and then they, the reason they had to do the open heart surgery is because the tumor had grown into the bottom of my heart. Wow. So they saw my heart for 17 minutes. Uh, the surgeon poked his finger through the bottom of my heart 
to get pieces of the tumor out uh, to clear the, the heart of the tumor. Um, he had, they had to inspect all of my organs. Uh, I was on perfusion, which is your heart is stopped. The, and it you know, recirculates re your blood through a machine. Uh, and they had to lower my temperature down to 67 degrees because they wanted to slow all of my metabolic processes. Um, the total surgery took 14 hours and there were three, I mean, there were 15 specialists working on me. Uh, three hours of that was waiting for my body temperature to come back up so that they could continue the surgery. Uh, it was crazy. It is the craziest thing that's happened to me. Uh, I'm happy to be alive. One of the reasons why I kept on pushing to be like, I'm, I'll show up at your house and come and do this thing instead of through Skype or whatever. Yeah. Is because I, I think it's just face to face personal. It, there's just more, we, we can express so much more yeah. Yeah, when we're, uh, when we're there. And it's like, I am so less afraid of, I mean, I've never been that much afraid of being in the world, but I'm so like this whole, this whole coronavirus thing is, I'm empathetic to the people that are worried that something bad is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I personally think that most of us uh, that are, you know, under the age of 60 are probably going to be weather it pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand the, I, let me ask you this. What, what do you think is going on with the idea of quarantining, right? So it, should, we should quarantine ourselves if we have the disease so we don't spread it. Mm -hmm. But if we stop all of these events, is it to, I guess, it, it, I guess if we don't, if the NBA is canceled, then people can't bring the virus there to spread it. But at some point, don't we want people to get the disease so that either they can create their own antibodies for it in their body, or uh, we can have enough cases that we can find an antiretroviral based on, I don't know, like I, I yeah. just don't understand enough why there's so much panic to keep people inside, mm -hmm. but that's me. That's, yeah. yeah, that's my confusion. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, from what I'm understanding, it people seem to be saying that it's sort of just like uncharted waters, mm -hmm. and they don't know, sort of like back before there was vaccines with the plague and things like that yeah. um until they can find a vaccine or learn more about it i think they're just playing it safe uh, that makes sense and i guess it's not just from hands but it's airborne so well it's it's it can it's be foam, it's fomite born what so, does that mean so that means if you if and again like this is probably a relatively safe distance mm -hmm. but if a piece of spittle mm -hmm. lands on let's mm -hmm. say your lip that that's a fomite that's a a basically uh like a, a, a fomite can also be on your any flat surfaces any mm -hmm. surface mm -hmm. that it unless it's clean will be a, a contact point for mm -hmm. the disease mm -hmm. so it's not airborne in the sense of like it doesn't it's not on the water vapor of our breath and you'll inhale it like if somebody with a cold or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. It's it's fomite born, okay. which means if you if I sneeze and it, it let's say it gets on the surface here and then you come and, and touch that later on, if the virus is in there, then you touch your face. That's it's really the it's really a contact uh, way of, of distributing. I listened to a virologist on a podcast yesterday. Okay, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I have this in my head. Uh huh. Uh, I've never heard that word fomite. Before. Yeah, that's it's funny if you watch. I think contagion the. Mm -hmm. Uh, they talk a lot about fomites. Yeah. They, they, they basically, like in that one, uh, just like in the outbreak, the, the disease starts off from like one-to-one -one contact and then mutates and becomes airborne. You know, yeah. that's, this is like these typical pandemic uh, movie cycles is like, you know, it's, uh, as long as you don't touch the person, you're okay. But then like suddenly like Dustin Hoffman's like, it's airborne, you know, yeah. like whatever, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm walking here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't sneeze on me. I'm walking here. Uh, yeah, I saw, I think, Contagion, one of those movies with a healthcare practitioner, and she was getting really upset because everyone <laughs> everyone is using hand sanitizer, Ooh. and she's like, you need soap. Yeah. Hand sanitizer doesn't kill viruses. No. You need, you need a, I forget the word for it, but it's a way in which the soap will actually grab the oil and material off your hand and when you rinse it off that's when you're actually taking the the whatever the stuff off mm -hmm. of your hands um and uh, the hotter the water the better hotter because that, that, that's going to contribute to the 
the foaminess and the getting all the extra little bits of oil out of your hand that then the when you rinse off your hands that all that dirt's taken away. Really, if you're putting alcohol on your hands, you're hoping that you're going to kill 80 to 90 percent of the actual bacteria on your hands. It's still going to be there, you know. So alcoholics should be fine when they're sweating out the vodka yeah, right. through their pores. <laughs> I mean, I think alcoholics are going to be fine anyways because if they're there, it's almost like being pickled is its own antibody. Mm -hmm. When I was a junkie and a, an alcoholic, I never got sick. It was amazing. It was like the best thing in the world. When I, if you did get sick, you could drink or the, yeah, use yeah, the drug and exactly, feel better. Exactly. Exactly. Also, when I first got uh, first got sober, um, like so, let's say I quit smoking cigarettes, then I get these crazy sinus infections because I think all the little ash and dirt that, you know, that clogs your sinuses when you're smoking, mm. it is beneficial for not having like uh, uh, allergies. Oh, right. But then when you quit smoking, it's like all your sinuses are suddenly all clear and it's yeah. like everything's coming in there. Yeah. So it's the same thing with alcohol. I stopped drinking and then like the my stomach chemistry, my gut bacteria changed and I was just, just sick all the time mm -hmm. because I wasn't washing it down with, you know, yeah, yeah, it's and, interesting. Yeah, no, it, it, it's it's weird. And then you know, like I'm trying to think. Like, I don't think the one thing that like coming off of crack did for me is I never, I didn't have a fucking blister on my weapon. <laughs> That's the thing. That's, I'll tell you, if you watch a movie about real crackheads, they will always have like a burnt blister on their lip mm. because did you? I because mean, it heats up. Yeah, because it heats up the glass pipe heats up. You were you were from Washington DC. DC. Did you ever get to see? Face to face, any of the crack epidemic kind of stuff? Was it around you? It was. Uh, or were you like, like more I'm, the burbs? Kind I know of... I came. No, oh, yeah. I know I wasn't like in the streets. Okay. Dealing or copping, but <laughs> uh, I've definitely came across people. Yeah. 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 That's because I feel like it probably, especially when you, when you were growing up, it was probably still a little a little shaky out there. What, what, wait, you were telling me about the kind of music that's very specific. Go-Go. Go-Go. Yeah, I love I, it. I wonder if there's an interplay between, like, I mean, obviously the uh, the people that migrated there, either from African or Haitian or whatever countries, but then you look at, like, jazz and um, even, even early hip-hop that's definitely influenced by the various chemicals that are going around. Right. Because I wonder if there's a crack in Like white lines. Movies. Yeah. Or or even like, um, you know, there's there's this crazy thing, the crack epidemic actually took out all these um, Harlem jazz artists uh, and heroin and crack took them out. So there's this whole kind of truncated generation of black jazz artists that could have like they would have been contemporaries like herbie hancock and stuff like that but they he didn't have any real contemporaries mm. and that's why he became as popular as he did you just reminded me of the guy who was um i can't think of his name but he was shot and killed over here he was a singer african-american oh, um, yes with an amazing voice sam cook yeah yes and it seemed like drugs were involved mm -hmm. in that even mm -hmm. though he was shot no it was, it was somebody i forget who it was but some person in his group of friends was having some drug situation mm. and you know <clears throat> Jimi Hendrix J Jimi Hendrix for sure Jim Morrison Jim, J Janis Joplin even though there's alcohol for her um Amy Winehouse yeah I mean obviously that's oh, yeah. current more current fucking I uh, mean we could go on forever. Yeah, yeah, forever we could it's, go for an hour yeah exactly just listing all the fucking people uh but musicians and then artists actors, and, actors yeah yeah um it's so interesting because one of the theory that I'd heard about like the whole idea of the 27 Club is there's kind of these multiple factors being played out, which is it's people who had probably not had really good access to a lot of alcohols or drugs in their life, then suddenly there's all this money and fame coming out of, at them, and they want to be demonstrating to the world that they're bigger and badder than anybody else because they're rock stars. And so you get these combined things of like, oh, recent money to be able to fulfill all of your desires plus this desire this fucking desire to look like a badass and just one it's lucky like some like keith richards or whatever didn't uh yeah but keith moon did so you know he's like the exception oh yeah unlimited money you're traveling in new social circles 
parties. Yeah, and everybody's giving you fucking yes, drugs. Yes, man. Yeah. It's got, I mean, it's got to be a heady mix. Like, Tragic. How, how would I, like, how would a mere mortal be able to say no to the all the, these things being offered to it? And you might feel, you know, peer pressure, for lack of a better word, to yeah. try something. Yeah. And then you're hooked. Yeah. That, that's, I think that's what's happened a lot of times. Or the other thing is the, the high on stage is not a, like you, you want to continue that feel and then like you add drugs to it. I, I think that's there's also, point. I think there's also this other factor of like, oh, I'm so good at this job. I'm getting all this adulation. Oh, I bet you I can go on stage a little fucked up and they'll still love me. I bet you I can go even more fucked up and they'll still love me. You know, and then you start becoming dependent on your performance. Or that. another situation where you rise to super rich, super famous, but you still feel empty and unhappy yeah. or lonely. Lonely. Okay, it's, I got to imagine like... I have everything that everyone says you should want and I still don't feel whole. So you look for something look else. Look for drugs, yeah. I mean, I'll say definitely. I mean, what, I was 32 when I got sober, so... I didn't know you were sober. Yeah, I uh, I was a big old crackhead right at the end, just for like a ten month period. As a tweaker for most of the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say like currently I was allow myself to maybe microdose or psychedelics. I, I'm open to. Uh, last March April, I was on a little bit of a beer binge, mm -hmm. and I realized, well, number one, it doesn't make me happy. It does. I don't really feel that good. I can't really get that drunk and I know it's so bad for my body mm. then I woke up like a Saturday after having you know drank a pint of Guinness or something like that or you know, 20 ounces or and I was just depressed I was just so sad and I was like oh I can't my brain can't handle this mm. I can't do this mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah and I've, I've been basically sober since uh, 2002 congratulations yeah thanks did the doctors say anything about what you can and can't do? Well, they would. I, I always, this? I always front, foreground like, well, I'm a sober guy or whatever. I don't drink, so they're like, yeah, well, so we don't necessarily have to warn you about alcohol. But I only have one kidney, so mm. I can't process really alcohol. As mm. a, I mean, I've had a beer or two since the surgery, just as like part of a meal. But I don't ever want to get intoxicated again. Like I don't want to my body because intoxication is literally your body is shutting down processes because you it's the word tox mm. toxification mm. you're toxifying your body you get intoxicated your body is responding by shutting down brain function eye function uh, audible you know or the, your ability to speak because it's trying to fight this toxicity that you have so if I've got one kidney I'm gonna I probably get fucked up pretty fast if I were to really try mm -hmm. but it's also then it puts your whole body on high alert and you know it's like fuck that shit yeah yeah is there anything else that stands out to you about the whole going to UCLA hospital and well yeah so I went to UCLA film school so it was a little bit of a homecoming it was, uh -huh. it was, it was really nice uh, the Ronald Reagan uh, whatever that uh, medical center hadn't been built they were just building it when I was there, so I got to be in a building that didn't exist <clears throat> when I was at UCLA. Um, the care that I got at UCLA, I mean, there's, I've got so much of like things that happened in the ICU and all this crazy dramatic stuff, but just from the medical side, everybody at UCLA is very kind and patient. I, I found it so stark compared to like, a lot of the Blue Shield, I started off at Blue Shield, and then like kind of like, I'll call it the Medi Medi-Cal Wild West, like out in the valley, these doctors that are at these, overworked at these clinics that take Medi-Cal, you know, that, like, they're always nice enough, but they're always very beleaguered. You finally get into UCLA, and they have the money, like, they have people, they have so many tiny little specialists, that there's a guy that just wanders around all day doing uh, respiratory tests. There's a guy with his uh, mobile x-ray machine that just does chest x-rays all day. And so going to this hyper professional situation compared to, like I said, the wild west of, of the rest of the medical system was such a relief. Everybody was, and obviously they are literally the top doctors in the world. The, the guy who performed my surgery is one of the very few people in the world 
that has performed the surgery. So when this shows up, he's the one that does it. They move them. So he was saying that one or two of these surgeries, basically like a radical nephrectomy with open heart surgery, eliminating thrombus material, uh, only one or two of these occur at the major facilities around the world. So probably 20 to 30 of these surgeries happen a year, which is not very many. You know, he is, he is good at what he does. So he is always going to be prepared if, it, if it's not, if it falls away from standard, you know, uh, a standard surgery. Um, but yeah, I had to have the cardiologist open me up and stop my heart. Then the urologist had to come in and clear out all the tumor material and remove the, and then, you know, kind of re rewire all the stuff inside, uh, inspect all my organs. And then uh, they they had to make sure everything worked afterwards too. It's super it's scary. amazing. It's amazing, but again, it's a miracle. Like, so I I've been talking a lot about, and I'm gonna, I'm working on a memoir memoir right now. But this nice. is my my basic philosophy that I came out of this is I have three kinds of faith. The first number one faith is faith in science. These are the top doctors in the world. They know exactly what they're doing. Medical is going to pay for them to give me the best uh, possible care that that exists. So number one is faith in science. Number two is just traditional baby Jesus faith. Baby Jesus wants me to live. Thank you, baby Jesus, get me through this. That kind of just like, that, and, and again, I'm not necessarily- He was a grown man. Well, but he's, uh, but the baby, baby is the one that's telling me. Oh yeah, that's right. Thank he you. was a grown man. Yes. Oh. Such a great movie. I love okay. that movie. Uh, that's uh, probably the best of Four, all those. Six pound, eight ounce, <laughs> baby Jesus in your crib. I fucking Sasha Baron Cohen as the gay uh, French oh, driver. Perfect. Like I, he did. He's and that's what you fall in love with him there, and then you just follow him through all of his other stuff, and it's like, rest assured, whatever he does is going to be gay. Yeah. Yeah. It's too, you were on your third type of faith. Oh. Uh, baby Jesus, faith. third kind of, I'm calling it basically sci-fi faith, right? At a certain point when they gave me the drugs to knock me out, uh, I entered a portal where I could have gone to a side where I was getting defibrillated on the, the table or some kind of complication where I'm crippled the rest of my life. But the portal I went through when I got knocked out brought me to this side where I'm perfectly healthy and everything is okay. It's like I I had these visions, right, as I'm coming up to the surgery of like, oh, who's gonna take care of my dog? Who's gonna like take care of all my stuff? Like that to me, I put in the realm of like, those are possible other realities that may have happened and I was getting a bleed through from it, but my faith that I was going to pass through, pass through this portal and come out on the other side in this perfect condition, carried me through. I mean, who knows? Maybe there's a fucking deformed Sean in another universe. Yeah. Yeah. Do you watch, have you watched Rick and Morty? I love Rick and Morty. I, I, it's, I, it's almost like it's a, a product built perfectly for me because I'm such a huge sci-fi fan. Like, just imagine even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, something like Rick and Morty, you wouldn't have had the cultural reference points to be able to be like, oh, I'm just making a portal to this other universe, and there's a million Ricks in that universe, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't have existed. Mm -hmm. People would have, like, the concept would have been a little bit too fuzzy Confusing. for people. Yeah, to get. I'm just trying to think what other shows had that uh, different dimensions, like uh, Sliders. Sliders had a little bit of it, Quantum Leap, but, it, it, but they were always, this is like, this is this big thing that we're doing. But now in Rick and Morty, it's just like, you know, it, it's so easy. Realities. Yeah, they just, yeah, it's just like it's like going on. Yeah, a, they blow it off. Yeah, which, which, as a storytelling device, the fact that they can take away, like I call it uh, in a lot of shows, I call it a, a hot tub time machine. You just need to have a technology that's going to make the magical sci-fi thing happen in your universe. Their ease with all of these kind of magical elements allows them to tell us so many interesting stories 
because they can get away Unlimited. from... Unlimited. Yeah, they can get away from having to explain yeah. how this shit works. Get bogged down in the science yeah. and everything. Yeah. Time travel is not exactly the same, but it just I was thinking about Back to the Future and then The Simpsons where he goes back and sneezes. Yes, yeah. But no, but, but also, I would say, like, all that time travel... Alternate... Yeah, it, 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 you know the way they talk about it is like it, it. You know, it doesn't necessarily loop. It goes into another tunnel. You know, so these are ways in which our brains start conceptualizing the ideas of multi multi dimension. Because <clears throat> I think it was H. G. Wells wrote the Time Machine in whatever 1880, 19, whatever, whenever it was. That was the first time that idea was kind of put out into the culture, mm. and of course, his was like. Some kind of weird steampunk um, machine that just fast forwarded to the future. You couldn't actually stop. It was almost like this weird suspended animation that you were in while you were in the ma machine, uh -huh. and then you could stop it at some point in the future. But as far as like early sci-fi goes, it's a fucking great idea. Interesting. Yeah. 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 It is. It's fascinating. I wonder what drugs he was on. I bet you. I bet you. Here's the thing. A lot of them, yeah, for sure. I, or uh, I was doing, I was on the Dilaudid. Opium? Yeah. Opium, yeah, they're probably the same. Yeah, I bet you he was. But that was also the era of rich people having as much cocaine as they wanted to. Oh. Yeah, because like cocaine. Had, yeah, exactly. Cocaine had just come on the market in a commercial sense. So they were probably just like, you know, it's a little stuff like Freud, like just like, oh, uh, would we have psychoanalysis? Would psychiatry be as popular today if fucking Freud wasn't coked to the gills. Thanks, cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> this message brought to you by... No, I... I but it, but it's a recurring theme of this podcast. Well, I'm a fucking former junkie. Uh, you know? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Um, so it was Freud, apparently. Yeah, but also I look at, like, um, the Nazis were all on fucking meth. You know? Really? Oh, yeah, there, there's a Previtin was a basically a um, methamphetamine pill. Uh, there are letters, that I, I read a book about the history of, of speed. Uh, there are letters that the, the, the German soldiers would write home saying, mom, dad, send me more money. I need to get more Previtin. Mm. But this is, I think that's what's responsible for the Blitzkrieg, what's responsible for the kind of, the way in which uh, the Nazis were kind of just like overnight taking over Europe because everybody was whacked out on drugs. But that being said, I think, you know, probably FDR was taking a little bit himself. We know Churchill was a total alcoholic. I'm sure he was augmenting with some pet pills to kind of keep up. So I have a theory that all of the 20th century is mostly driven by drugs. You know, yeah. the history of it. Wow. Though I feel like the older I get, the more it seems like no one knows what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, and you're doing a podcast of talking to old people about their wisdom, and I'm sure most of them are like, I don't know how I got here. Not kidding, but yeah, yeah, I know. It just like it seems like. Do you ever feel that way? Like everyone is so stupid. Yes, I've also had this theory that uh, the veneration of our elders was probably better at a time when the people that actually survived into old age had earned it. Nowadays, almost everybody survives in the old days because we have so much medicine. You don't have to be clever to be old nowadays. You just have to have insurance, mm. you know, or mm -hmm. whatever. So I think that we- Making good life choices and on just as far as diet, exercise, we could resolve. Job. Yeah, but we can solve all that stuff with- Right, with before drugs. I'm yeah. saying. Oh yeah. Yeah. Or, or I didn't even think of going back to when the true veneration of our elders came, was like, let's say, when we were living on the plains or when we were in these, this kind of uh, like early agricultural time where people were dead by the time they were in their early 30s. They made a few kids. They were grandparents by the time they were in their 30s anyways. And uh, a person that lived to be in their 60s or 70s had to be doing something very right. First off, not to be even killed by the other people in their tribe being like, oh, this fucking old asshole is complaining about his fucking, you know, ailments again, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Because because there's also this this theory that a lot of um, uh, a lot of older people were either set adrift uh, on ice flows, like the 
uh, um, Inuits would do, or somebody would come up behind them and hit them in the back of the head with a rock when they were not useful to the tribe anymore. So mm -hmm. you had to be able to prove your usefulness for a lot longer period. So I think their veneration of old people starts there, and then now there's an entitlement around a lot of people, older people, where it's like, you need to respect me, because I don't know. I don't want to diss on too many old people, because they're going to... You just reminded me, did you ever, I don't know, it's possible, did you ever read the um, writings of Cabeza de Vaca? I've heard, but I haven't. He was a priest, I believe, on a ship that, from Spain, yeah, yeah. Cortez had just found all this gold in South America, and they were looking, they thought they were going to go find gold in Florida, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there was no gold, just um, a lot of natives Vegas. attacking them, yeah, yeah. and he became a prisoner, and he, um, someone was sick or dying or something, and he did like the cross or something over them and said a prayer, and whoever he was with thought he was some sort of, um, what do you call it? Like, like a, the shaman or something. Yeah. Like yeah. And he started walking from village or group to group, and everyone would follow him. Whoa! I and, mean... And he'd get to the next place, and the people following him would say, He's a healer. He's magic. He's yeah, a yeah. healer. And he walked, I guess, all the way from Florida to Texas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I know about that part. I didn't know about the healer part. You should make a movie out of that. That would be fucking great. You could even make a television show, right? Yeah. Because it's got such a long period of time, and it'd be, you know, and then, I don't know, they like, I feel like all the intrigue of like, what happens, how do the, okay, so there's this idea that this, this wave is coming, right? Like, let's say if you're in somewhere in Eastern Texas, and it's like, oh, he's coming, he's on his way, like, how do the local people start like, preparing themselves to have this kind of, this charismatic person kind mm -hmm. of come into their town mm -hmm. is it going to change their it's almost like i got a deadwood vibe to it yeah. yeah and it reminded me of the man who would be king also. yes yeah 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 um and then but then yeah you can have the spanish elites that are sort of Ugh, we don't need this guy to upset we've got we've got it going good right about now what's happening. yeah exactly yeah yeah i like it let's pitch it all right let's do it uh speaking of making movies um you were kind enough to meet me a yeah, while yeah. back at the 101 yeah. because in a moment of inspiration motivation um i tend to be like all or nothing yeah, yeah, yeah like don't feel like doing anything or i feel like doing 12 things at once you know some good add going on yeah, there. yeah. well you get momentum oh yeah so i just literally went on facebook and started and typed in something like screenwriting or screenwriter yeah and seeing which of my friends had screenwriter on their profile and you were one of them. Oh, nice. And I messaged you saying, one of you write movies? Yeah, yeah. And we actually met through improv originally. Yeah, One Love, baby. One Love, is that where we first met? I would say probably, probably. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how long has that show been going on? It'll be eight years in June. Wow. Every Monday night. Holy shit. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Yeah, and the indie scene has sort of died down since it's sort of renaissance. Well, it, it's interesting, I would say, like, not necessarily, we'll go back to the coronavirus and we'll get back to this, the, how, like kind of how we got together. But I think with all of the recent uh, Me Tooing that's been happening to a few of the instructors at the various schools and stuff. Really? I think that that has contributed to this idea. I mean, I think that the, let's say the UCB star is fading, right? All the people that were gonna get jobs through let's say New York UCB and then LA UCB, they're all kind of established now. I think what's going on now is they're just like where Second City was 20 years ago. You know, it's like come and take a class here. You know, sort they, of. Yeah, they're, they're just, it's, they just established as another place to go to in LA to get some training. You know, they're not that same kind of like, you're getting a job, you're getting a job. Because mm -hmm. I just think the people, except for maybe uh, Jordan Peele, I think everybody's kind of in their writer rooms or they're trying to pitch their own projects and they're not really necessarily reaching back to the theater but the way they used to mm -hmm. even seven or eight years ago mm -hmm. uh, to find talent, you know? It, it, but I think it, it, it grew so fast. Yes. Like, really like big, really fast. Really big, really fast. Second 
theater with two extra stages. Yep. And then the pack theater has also sprung up. Was all shows, you know, they had shows all across the, the calendar that were full all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think part of it is the Renaissance is over, but part of it is people pulled back the uh, curtain <laughs> and saw that, well, there's a little bit of abuse of power here. It doesn't, it's, it's still, there's the, the politics that you would hope would be not as prevalent in something like improv were still there, mm -hmm. you know? I don't know if I knew about the full extent of what you're talking about. Well, I mean, I would say, what, maybe four or five years ago, there were all these secret Facebook groups mm -hmm. where women were comparing notes on all the creeps that they knew in the comedy scene. Mm -hmm. And a few, few guys got kind of like me too and pushed out. But I think what ended up happening is... A band from the clubhouse or a band, band from, the, yeah, from exactly. the CV. Yeah, for sure. But I think what ended up happening is it created this environment that went from, let's say, the punk rock, we can get stage time and we can do whatever we want, to being like, now we're all official. Mm. And they battened down the hatches and they really vetted everybody. And I think that that took the steam, the, t the energy out of a lot of the fun and playfulness that is inherent in improv, mm. but it also attracts unscrupulous characters. You know, it's like when you have the Wild West mentality, you're gonna get some fucking con men and I love my favorite word, mountebanks, people that are out there to kind of like try to scam the system. But then as, as you become more official, the, those kind of uh, characters can't inhabit the space, but then it takes a lot of the excitement and the thrill mm. out of improv. Mm. I mean, you know, I remember playing whatever, 10 years ago, I'd go on the stage and I'd play like a redneck kind of racist guy. And people would understand that I was playing a character. But a few years ago, you go on playing a redneck racist guy and you, the crowd would turn on you because you're representing something that they dislike and so they didn't have this critical distance. So I think that's another contributing factor mm. to the kind of the sensitivity of the audiences has shifted, especially in LA. That's interesting. Yeah. You just reminded me that I have personal experience with this because you know Mock Improv? Yeah, yeah. Um, they have like 20 to 30 regular performers and then they'll invite like five to 10 oh, yeah, guests. Yeah, 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 that's right. Well, a couple of years ago, my friend, one of the hosts, Ooh. asked me to give oh, you a napkin. Oh, no, uh, oh, okay. Oh, wow, oh, wow. That, was quite a, that was quite over. a move. <laughs> I've never fallen over like that. I don't that think in my life. That was amazing, by the way. So, like like I, in my life, I don't ever think I've ever fallen, think, gotten up and fallen over like yeah, that. Yeah, I think it was crazy because I think that you just had the confidence that you can kind of just like almost just like lean over to the 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 uh, drawer. drawer and you just like it's like your body was just like bah, 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 bah. I went down. Yeah. It's great. It was awesome. Now, uh, so mock, back to mock improv. Oh, so one of the hosts who's I consider one of my friends asked me to be a guest one mm -hmm. night and I said of course because because I always felt like if they asked me that I would perform at mock every Thursday yeah it's a fun I mean, show I was already doing when I moved here before I started one love mm -hmm. with a couple other guys I would go to um, crash bar every Sunday mm -hmm. cage match at UCB every yep. Wednesday yep, yep. I would watch the Heralds on Monday yeah I would go to the 11th hour show on Thursday yep. I think there, uh, was there still TNT? Was uh, TNT? I would yeah, go every yeah, Tuesday. Yeah. Harrison and Johnny were just the Fucking nicest great. guys yeah. ever, and Jonathan Smith. Um, oh, so then my friend messaged me and said, "Actually, I can't perform at Mock because one of the regular performers wasn't comfortable performing with me." Mm -hmm. And I followed up, and he said that I because I um, perpetuate gender stereotypes or something like that. Sure. And I just sort of felt like, I felt really angry. Sure. Because I felt like, I don't know what I did or said. Would you, it, it, and I, here's what I will say, and that, like, that, that specific thing is like, if you have something wrong, there, if there's something wrong with, if you feel that there's something wrong with that, what I'm saying, Stop me in the moment and let me know. Even if we're in a scene, call it out. There's so many ways in a scene. But again, like I'm just saying that from my standpoint, 
Or even, I understand if someone feels uncomfortable talking to me directly, yeah. they could have someone else say something but to me. But do it more closer to the event so that you can so that you can review what you've done and maybe adjust your behavior. I have no idea what I did or yep. said. Yep. But I just felt like, okay, so if you don't if no one tells me what I did or said that made them uncomfortable, how can I learn and change from their behavior? Yeah. I mean I feel like we're all learning and growing as performers, right? Like or at least trying I'm to. Not an expert yeah. on improv and I definitely wasn't back then. And then um I felt paranoid like are other people talking about me? Mm, Is this going to affect making a Herald team at UCB? Oh, yeah. Did I... Oh, my God. And, you, and so you were, I, the, in the, back you were of my, in the heat of all that fucking bullshit. Or just... Woo. Well, I mean, I don't feel like I was because I just didn't go to mock and then that was that. That was enough, yeah. yeah but I felt like, you know... Also, it was on stage, I think. Whatever I, I did. Yeah. And I don't know. I'm like, did I did I play a, a woman like as a as like a cliché... Mm -hmm. Woman voice. I tell you what. Yeah. I, or did I accidentally call a? Did a woman walk on stage and I called her a woman when she could have been playing a man? Like, and I'm so I'm just like, so now when I'm improvising after that, I've like have this in the back of my mind. And and super self -conscious. I'm in a scene where it's like, which like, I would want to grow and change. Like, I would want to correct the behavior yeah. if I'm making someone uncomfortable. I that really gave me but, a but sour taste I'll tell you in though, my mouth. I'll tell you though, yeah, and, and I think that, that that is one of the con concomitants of what's causing this uh, deflation of the improv scene. It, I really do, I think it's part, like when I say the Me Too thing, but it's also the sensitivity and the reaction, and then the, it, there's like this weird kind of like... Comedy in general? Comedy in general, but that's why I'm doing uh, fucking more stand-up than I am. Stand-up and storytelling than I am improv. As much, I think improv is fucking magic. When you get up on stage and you're sharing the group mind with that, that people and you invent something so beautiful and unique to those, that group of people that are on that stage and that audience and it goes, it vanishes into the ether and that everybody's laughing or, or they're all on the same page, there's nothing more beautiful than that. But when you're feeling a little bit self-conscious, you got this little thing in the back of your head or you're feeling a little um, like, you have to walk this PC line, or if you play a character, if you don't indicate strong enough that this is a character and you're playing it from the standpoint that you want the audience to see the day. I, I loved playing like a few years ago, like I'll just say Trump supporters. It was fun to be like the bad guy on stage. But then after a while, people would just be like losing the idea that I'm playing a character and maybe think that I actually it, it, this is this is the bigger problem that I'm experiencing with the state of it's comedy, but it's it's more sensitive in improv, which is like these personal political things that people are experiencing that they want you to be sensitive to, but they're not communicating their sensitivity around it, and, I, and it sucks because we're straight white men in this culture and. Our sensitivity to the issue is already going to be assumed to be wrong, uh, and uh, as a person that I hang out in a bunch of queer and trans communities, and I'm like, I part of one of the reasons I did that is because I don't want to be the fucking jackass caught out using the wrong pronoun for somebody. You know, I want to be sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of it is, people in those communities have two things. They're gonna give you a pass if you say the wrong word and you're at least trying to be sensitive. And they'll tell you in the moment, hey, please use this pronoun for me. The other thing is if they are seeing elements of oppression or manipulation in your language, uh, they may call you out harder than just somebody who's, like if you're being unconscious of your privilege in a conversation with somebody, they may come back at you pretty hard, but if you're trying to not express too much privilege, they often are like, by the way, you know. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I think in, in this situation where you asked not to play, but people couldn't give you the evidence of what you had done wrong, it makes you feel like you are wrong. I just loved improv so much. I was just kidding. You know, and put yes. so much time and energy yeah. into it. Um, it's, it's, it's weird because it's a, there's the act, entertainment career stuff, and then there's the social part, and the social and uh, career stuff is so intertwined. Yes. Well, because um, we're also 
performers and we want to be loved and we want mm -hmm. to connect with people. And that is both a superpower and the kryptonite of a performer is that can that level of connection. Mm. Like if I were to be like, Hey, can you let me talk to your agent? You know what I mean? Like then you're like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, how it's close weird. Are we? Yeah. How I don't want to go to a party to network. Yeah. Cause it feels phony, but also you don't want to go to a party and not let people know that shit's going on for you too. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is. It's a, it's, the whole thing makes you want to do drugs. Uh, back to Cafe 101. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, and also, I just want to say, like, less people being sexually harassed and molested and raped and... It's always... Good. Yeah, good. More and, people and, being held accountable for... It's, it's amazing. In the I, workplace, everywhere. But and I, and I, and all I, and all I'm even saying about that is it's... It's it soured those revelations soured what I thought was a fun, amazing because I'm not one of those guys, even though like I might play that character or I've had some things in my past where I've been a little bit like kind of creepy or shady. When I got involved in improv, I kind of like I'm gonna say I went all pretty neutral on a lot of those behaviors because I was like, you know, I don't want to bring this energy to this community mm -hmm. uh, because I felt like th this openness and this kind of wanting to, to be the best version of myself available. But when I look at like kind of some of these abuses of power and I, you know, whatever, I could list a whole shit ton of people and they're out there on fucking TV shows and they're writing, I go, oh, there's almost a part, I mean, now that it's all shut down, great, but there's almost a part of me that feels like, well, if I wasn't doing a casting couch move on a girl or behaving in this, way it's almost like you get reward you got rewarded for it in that and it made it for me it soured this thing where it's like oh i don't want to behave that way i want to be a nice guy like you are the last person i would have imagined being asked to not do a show because you Thanks. have a generous kind warm spirit so the fact that you get called out is almost like this this policing sweep of just whatever like where we, you might be the guy that looks like somebody that triggers them in the past for something, and you don't know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, my one of my most recent ex girlfriends, I found out the reason she cried after we had sex is because I totally reminded her of her abuser, and I was like, well, is that why we're dating? And so I ended up breaking up with her because I was like, I don't want to fulfill that role mm -hmm. for her, and because you know, because the dynamic shifts in a way to put you in the to repeat some of those behaviors and well, I, I think I just confessed too much. No, not at all. Yeah. I think that's probably a more common experience yeah. than one would think. Yeah. Um, but no, I was just thinking Val Kilmer. Yeah. You worked as his assistant. His assistant, yeah. I'm like, we have to get to that before we finish. Oh, sure. If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any um, sto good stories that... So, I, the, the, well, the one that keeps on coming back to me is... You were Val um, Kilmer's assistant. Val Kilmer's, Kilmer's assistant. I was all this... Because I started off as his stage manager on um, uh, his Mark Twain, one-man Mark Twain show that he's now turned into a movie. He's been going through some throat cancer issues. Oh, man. So he can't really perform on stage anymore. That's too bad. Uh, I just heard that he is um, going to be part of the um, Willow remake that's coming. Love so Willow. That's, yeah, it's great. So I think he'll come back probably as Mad, Mad Mortigan. Mad Mortigan, but in a, like, probably having to deal with this. Willow. Yeah, this throat thing. Uh, yeah, and as an old guy. But, uh, so we went. That was, I was being the witch. Ah. Uh, when she turns, he turns her into a goat and everything. I'm going to tell, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to admit something. I know they're going to ask me to exit Hollywood with this admission. No one's going to listen to that. I've never seen Willow. It, it, I, I have a nostalgic love for it. Because you were probably right at that age where it was just like all magic and perfect. Like seven. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, part of one of the reasons I haven't seen it is it passed me by mm -hmm. at the time when it came out. I was just a little bit too old for that kind of stuff. But then in recently trying to track down a copy of it, it's like, there's no streaming service like that. And I don't want to pay five bucks really? or seven bucks or whatever. You have like, to like illegally stream it, it or Yeah, and I probably should. Or look for a screening around town or something. They're probably, it'll come, if there's going to be a, if there's going to be a, uh, a sequel, yeah. Or a sequel, yeah. yeah. Then it'll come back up. 
Uh, but he, uh, so we went to... There's a love potion in that movie that was, is hilarious. Which, you know, speaking of, if you think of, like, Cosby, yeah. right? Yeah. He was giving love potions to... to uh, yeah. Back to the meeting. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But, but, but that's, those, those are those places where, um, like, you could turn fantasy dark. But we don't have to. No. No. It's so Tombstone funny. is one of my favorite movies ever. Uh -huh. Doc Holliday, I'll Val be, Kilmer. I'll be a Huckleberry. Uh, I could quote that entire movie, I think, from start to finish. So, I've watched it more than any other movie. Because oh. I would just put it on in the background while I'm cleaning or studying. Ah, so that was Blade Runner for me. But yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. So he's doing, he's doing Twain, right? Yeah. And it's still Val performing as Twain. His performance is... Spectacular in NoHo or somewhere. So he was doing it. He uh, he did it at, at a bunch of locations. He did it at the, the Shakespeare Theater downtown. Okay. He did it at the Masonic Lodge over at the the cemetery at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Oh, cool. um, he then when I was touring with him, I went to Missouri. It was William Woods University. I can't remember what city it is, but mm -hmm. it was outside of uh, where Twain uh, grew up. Grew up mm -hmm. Hannibal. It's near. It's oh, the yeah. closest. One of the closest universities to Hannibal, Missouri. Nice. So they were giving him an honorary PhD, and he was going to perform the play over the weekend. Um, and one of the funnest, amazing things that he would do is he would drop his fucking classic Val Kilmer lines into fucking Twain. I'll be your Huckleberry. Just to please the crowd. But Huckleberry Finn. I'll be your Huckleberry. Fucking uh, yeah, the crowd would lose amazing. their shit, and he's like, he's such an amazing. I was gonna tell a little bit of a dark story, but I'm gonna go with happy go lucky Val stories because yeah. I love Val. I think he's amazing. Um, he is, as I say, he is one of the greatest performers. He's been classically trained as an actor since he was 19, and mm -hmm. he's in his 50s now. Mm -hmm. So he's got 40 years of being in that world. Mm -hmm. I would say... Top Gun. Top Gun. The Saint. So, uh, whatever, uh, he, what's the what's this famous line from Top Gun? He throw that in the... You're dangerous, Maverick. Why is... Why would somebody The universe dare? does not want yeah. us to have this podcast. Right? Phones ringing, me collapsing, coffee spilling. I do like the rain in the background. No, it is. It's great. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, so is uh, that Val? Someone uh, wouldn't that burning? be great? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, no, he did send me an email a few weeks ago, but it's more. Forgive about... me if I don't shake hands. Yeah. Oh. What? Oh, that's perfect line for what's going on now. Uh, it is. Yeah. But he had, to to yeah, he had the tuberculosis. Yeah. I've got two guns, one for each of you. <laughs> you you are a fucking diehard. Oh, man, I, gotta, I am. I gotta take a look at that. So he he sprinkled these lines, but oh, what is it saying about the superpower? of a person that is as sensitive and as well-trained. And, and there's a little bit of the alphaness in him because there's a little bit of competition. And uh, his acting is a superpower. He could say a line in a way that would make you respond like as if he had dug into your, the deepest part of your brain. So I was doing slides for him and I, I, I was able to he was like giving me notes on the thing. And I was able to fix it very quick. Like, blah, blah, blah. I got it done. And he's like, oh, that was very quick. Thank you very much. And he turned and he just like fucking aimed his smile at me like a fucking spotlight. And I was just like, I'm going to do whatever Val wants for the rest of his life. Like the fact that he was able to kind of like target and turn on the charm and, and really bring people over to his side. He would like at the end of the performances, he would will the audience to give him a standing ovation. He would just be like, do just like a little subtle moves in a way, and then just like everybody would just like, like it's almost like he was like orchestrating the crowd to give him what he wanted. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic being around that level of performer. I told him a story about a mushroom journey I had. I was up at Mount Shasta and I was, you mushroom know. Mushroom journey sounds like a improv team name. Oh my God, wouldn't that be a great, and then, of course, everybody's high, but whatever. Um, but uh, so I was telling him about this. That I had this very epic mushroom journey where um, the uh, my shaman slash you know therapist gave me this giant thing of mushrooms. I went through the story and I told him about how each of the mushrooms affected me. And it's probably like a 
20, 30 minute, no, maybe a 20 minute, 15, 20 minute story. As soon as I finished the story, he repeated it back to me in front of everybody else that was there. We were all just hanging out in the patio telling people stories. He repeated, he repeated it back to me, not necessarily word for word, but he got almost exactly the essence and the tonality. And I was just like, this is fucking incredible, but weird at the same time. Like he could just be a human mimic. He could just study you for a period of time and just go out and do you. Uh huh. It was, it was like a superpower. What did everyone else at the party think that he is repeating your story? Back? Uh, well, well there's a little bit. He's, uh, he's he was always playing a little bit of a dominance game with me. That was kind of the fun part about having so. I'm, I'm probably I'm on maybe eight or nine years younger than him, but I was like I was older than the college students. But again, like he was always kind of like like trying to you know compete or out, okay. a, little, a little out alpha, which. It's fun to play around with that, but he was m mocking me just a little bit, not in a bad way, but also like almost like making my story better uh -huh. by his performance of it to his friends, uh -huh. which are, well, we were all co -workers. I can see that. But it was still delightful. Mm -hmm. it, anytime a, somebody of that kind of like power and stature takes your words on, like that's is, this is the great thing about great actors is you can give them a shit fucking script and they can make it seem like it's not garbage, you know. Real genius. Did Real genius. Say, wait, the movie. Yeah. Real genius. Yeah. You know it. I know it. No, the crazy thing about that, oh, I was one of those fucking almost like kids that was going to be nerdy science kids. Yeah, nerdy science kids that was attempted to be recruited into college early. When I say nerdy, I meant more like genius. Genius. Yeah, I was one of those kids. So when that movie came out, it was like this weird like. Are they spying on me? I wasn't in college yet, but I was I was in high school, but I'd been going out to Caltech and stuff to be kind of like interviewed to get into these, like the laser targeting program at Caltech, or uh, there was some chemistry program at another college. And then, so when this movie comes out, I'm going like, uh, and then Val's in it. You related to Yeah. It. And I didn't realize when I actually got to The Doors movie that I oh, would yeah. be the doors. fucking hanging out with the lizard king hanging out with batman i went batman i went antiquing with fucking batman in fucking missouri it was amazing and again like you know he's he's human just like everybody so he's got insecurities he's got his you know just out there being in the world but when you have this power this ability to just connect so deeply and emotionally with people and to make your words have this impactful resonance from just like being the most actor actor that's ever lived i mean you know on some level uh he's been in some the most iconic but he, and the, it, each of those are he he gives himself over entirely like he was jim morrison mm -hmm. he was fucking johnny wad from wonderland there's a he, buddy cop movie where he's a gay guy yeah a kiss kiss bang bang yeah yeah and he, told, and he told me afterwards and this is one of the things is like he takes a little bit of each character and it lives with him the rest of his life. I get that. Yeah. This is not the same, but I feel like I've took on mannerisms from characters I played on yeah. stage yeah. where I never used to sit with my legs crossed like this, but then yeah. I played a character that did and then I he sits his with drink his pink, right? and, and I realized I, I started having my pinky out all the time when I drank. Well, I would say on some level that ability to occupy another person's skin as it were is the that's that is the heart of being a great actor i mean i say there's two kinds of actors and i would say like now i'd say define one kind as val kilmer that they so give themselves over to the part that they become invisible he's the saint he's fucking uh gay, gay perry from kiss case bang bang he's fucking doc holly in it he is those guys Bruce Willis is fucking Bruce Willis in every goddamn movie. Mm -hmm. uh, every movie. Daniel but Day Lewis. Da Daniel Day Lewis. But you want to go see Bruce Willis being Bruce Willis in what, every one of those movies. You don't need, I mean, he's got chops for sure. He can make you feel things, but he's making you feel things through Bruce Willis. You know, his characters may have different names, and I would never remember what those characters' names are, except mm -hmm. for John uh, McLean. McLean, yes. <laughs> but. To me, John McClane is Bruce Willis. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, he was probably going through a divorce at that time. You know, but you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the thing with film versus theater is like, 
you could have someone uh, put put on all this makeup and prosthetics and get into a character, or you can just cast someone that fits the part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that and that's the thing with Twain, and how uh, deep uh, Val went. He had like a a little cheek, he had a little mouthpiece that he was putting in, nice. this fake nose, and he would just, and he'd start doing Twain's accent. And it, and it was just like, whew, the transformation was amazing. And then sometimes, you know, obviously he'd drop a Huckleberry line or a fucking, you know, a Top Gun line, and the, and, the, and you'd see the wink of Val behind Twain. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until the makeup came off or he was off stage that he would release the character. And it was... Phenomenal. It was again like master class in whatever it takes to be. And I'd say a great actor, but for him, he was so superstar. He was one of the greats, or he still he still is one of the greats, mm -hmm. still out there doing mm -hmm. the thing. But it's just that the you know the his his stars. Yeah, you know, it's just getting to be an older guy. That's all. This is just, this is reminding me of my stepdad. Mm. He did a one man show about Dizzy Dean that he performed in. I think St. Louis and at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was on the Dukes of Hazard. Oh, yes, that's right. And he was a congressman. That's right. So the things you're saying about Val, it makes me think of him, too. And the way he is with the crowd and the way it doesn't matter because he's had, like, hip and knee and all kinds of health stuff. But when he gets on stage, I guess, like, most performers. I, I mean, I've had uh, – uh, there was a – Rick Shapiro was a comedian I knew, but he – we used to have this discussion, but that the stage is medicine. Being on camera, like I'm coming alive, like I was like, oh, I'm dealing with the rain, but like microphone, camera, an lights, audience, yeah, action. lights. That's like, I'm alive again, <laughs> you know, but it's, and I think it's true because it, it does put us into a, almost a mystical state when we are either in somebody else's shoes or up on stage. It really, you know, we go back to the ancient Greeks and they were, they were trying to uh, appeal to the gods by being of on course. stage. You know? Yeah, and now we're just trying to get Harvey Weinstein properly punished. I don't know, but you know. Yeah, uh, I want to get back to your. So you shot. A I movie. shot one scene. One scene. How do you feel about it? I feel okay about yeah. it. Yeah, I'm sort of. I feel like a little uh, stagnant now. Sure, sure. I, I bought it. Is it cut? The the one scene is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I bought a camera online okay. for like four hundred dollars. Not too bad. UPS from Jersey, <laughs> but the UPS guy did a little like tap 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 knock on the door, and then put that sticker thing where it says you have to go somewhere to pick it up. Ugh. And then I got these dental bills from the whitening and everything. Oh yeah. So I basically <laughs> let the camera be sent back to Jersey. Oh, because you were kind of like. Not unsure Financially, of what, yeah. like, oh, I yeah. can buy that camera again in a few months or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And then, so I'm weighing, like, I had one idea. Maybe it's 40 scenes in the movie. Okay. I thought, because, all right, so we talked about how difficult it can be to sell a script. And so my, I'm just trying to, like, do, like, ready, fire, aim. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to try to make this almost like that movie with Jack Black and most deaf yeah. home movies. Yeah. Just, like, film it and turn it into something. Yeah. A, a short, uh, a twelve-minute thing for slam dance. Yes. Or I mean, you, a thing that I can use to pitch it. Yes. Just having a thing. Yeah. That, that's better Just than a hundred pages going forward. That's also, I'd say, preferably, if you gave some, handed somebody a hundred pages and said, "Can you make my script?" It's like then they got to read all those hundred pages. Yeah. But if you're like, "Hey, look at my with on your phone. Look at this video I made," and they're like, "Oh, oh," you know, they, it's like the very smallest tidbit. And I feel like if. Like you throw a bunch of stuff at the wall, something might stick. Yeah. You do this over here, and then somehow it leads to something completely different over mm -hmm. here. Like I got my agent because a friend of mine from acting class was at the same Super Bowl party I went to, wow. and the only reason I went to the Super Bowl party was because I went to Sundance. Ah, shit! See, it's like weird like that. But but that's but I would say that that's the center the center taking action yeah the, taking action and and the other thing is like once your brain's been activated like I'm going to make this thing then you see the, the right the, the elements you could like put Neo. in yeah seriously yeah it's, it's and, and like when you came to talk to me about the the script I mean always my advice I'm gonna say it again over and over the lowest hanging fruit fruit the thing that you can actually 
take from the tree and put on your plate and make it a meal. Like that's mm -hmm. because so many people are like, oh, unless the script's perfect. I'm like, they're going to fucking rewrite the script anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. They may buy the idea from you. Mm -hmm. Are they going to pay you to rewrite it? Mm -hmm. But as long as your thumbprint is on whatever thing you do, mm -hmm. as long as it's got the Callahan touch to it. So I was considering maybe I'll use 40 different DPs. Yeah. Or even if it takes, if it's too complicated, even switch out actors and yeah. just put a little bit like, you just, look different. Or, or I would even say, depending on, because uh, to me, like, the, the it all will come together in editorial. Yeah. So, uh... You could edit it in a way, maybe not necessarily voiceover, but have some creative element where it's not even in the scene, but there's a way, maybe maybe the whatever character that you have just wears the same thing yeah. in every scene. Yeah. And that's enough, to, because that extra little thing that draws people in, letting them put it to, together in their heads, mm -hmm. is that's about shooting it with this different DPs, different actors. Mm -hmm. That to me sounds like one of these experimental movies mm -hmm. that would people would just be like, he took a lot of risks uh -huh. uh, with this, but it came together and I, right. you know, yeah, that that's... Um, like, I want to, uh, I don't want to bore people with all these details, but, like, I want to shoot a scene on this, in this living room, mm -hmm. but, like, outside my building is, like, Fraggle Rock. It's, like, construction constantly, neighbors oh, so, talking. Yeah, yeah. So, like, sound is not ideal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that obstacles like that. I'll tell you this. I mean, it, it just very easy, quick way to fix that. Uh, shoot it, even with the sounds going on in the background, uh, and then ADR it. Okay. Yeah. Because once you have, have them record the audio over top of it. Yeah. And you, Separately. I, my, yeah, my friend, my friend does it at, on his oh. fucking laptop at home all the time. Genius. Yeah. Thanks for bringing this up. Boom. I mean, they're, they're, all of these things have Probably been... Probably seems obvious. No, well, no, but, but it's also like, unless you've had to deal... I work in post. Yeah. Unless you've had to deal with it, these ideas don't occur to you. Uh, my buddy, well, you know, he's a, he's a great filmmaker, but he t tends to get kind of terrible audio because he's like, you're saying, point the camera, go, we're just going to get what we can. I go to his house, he fucking... Hits record on his uh, either Final Cut or Premiere or whatever it is. I just throw the line in there. I keep on doing it until he gets to the place where it feels like I'm saying it. Or he just has me do voiceover to explain a part of the scene as that character. Mm -hmm. Or if my head's... Like, that's the other the other cheat is if you shoot the back of somebody's head, you could change the dialogue endlessly. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I love that. That's one of the things they do in these... Uh, movies when like Patton Oswalt goes on to be a script doctor is they'll be like try to find all the shots of the back of the head and we'll put dialogue in t into those spots. Brilliant. But, yeah, but but uh, but also the fact that you're directing it and you're putting yourself in it, right? Yep. Yeah. It, you're gaining more experience in this world than 99% of the people out there mm -hmm. that are just like either working on their scripts or being actors for hire, you know, having more control over your what you're doing is going to give you, you just more ideas, and it's gonna just, it's just that, that flowering of inspiration that comes from. It's a journey. It is. It's a mushroom journey. Yeah. Where are you from? I grew up in the LBC, well, Lakewood. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm from here. Do you uh, know the Lakeside Stump? Is that what it's called? What? You know Fantastic Voyage? That song? No. By the Lakeside? No. Oh, you know Coolio's Come yeah, yeah. Along and well, That's a sample from. The Lakeside. Oh, are they I forget a local... their name. They're oh, no, from like the seventies. No, this is Lake Funk. Wood. Lake Wood. Oh, yeah, but that's not Lakeside. No, it's not Lakeside. But that sounds like it's a, probably Chicago. No, no, it's here. It's oh, it's an LA thing. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what Lakeside then it is. Maybe like a Silver Lake. I'll yeah. look it up. Yeah, yeah. Let um, me know. I feel stupid for not. Well, I grew up. My that Fantastic Voyage song was sampled. Ah. Or, or yeah, they brought the sample from the song. Yeah. Um. So it's crazy, but I grew up Snoop Dogg, Sublime, yeah. fucking uh, NWA. Like, those are all the local artists that came up when I was... Yeah, uh, Rage Against the Machine? Uh, they were around, but they were in Glendale. I was in Long Beach. Mm. Fucking NWA was like Long Beach and Compton. Beck? Beck, Silver Lake. <laughs> I mean, but also he's he didn't start making music until... Snoop. Was, Warren G and Nate Dogg. Oh, for one for my homie. We could, talk, we could talk another hour about yeah. that. I just, I wanted to ask you where you're from at the before we finish because I ask everyone where they're from mm -hmm. but I started to realize with my guests like 
when I started with where you're from and then people's childhood, it's like a lot of people have like shit they don't want to talk about sure. from their childhood. Sure. And get be like, oh, did you have a good relationship with your brother? No, no. it was bad. <laughs> and I love that you're trying to make this positive because the my podcast, which I haven't put out enough, I I've got backlogs of it. It's called. American, well, you haven't had me on it yet. That's why. Well, it's called American Grief Cast. Okay. Do you have a big person in your life that you lost? That you feel has changed. Like, my, it's my I, my father, when he died, it was such a shock. Mm-hmm. That it, it had, is this profound level of grief. It's usually, like, parents uh, or or brothers or sisters or children. Uh, with if you ha- it, it's, it's funny that I say this, but if once you've had that overwhelming experience, it's, it's, it's tough if it was a grandparent, but if you weren't, like, super close with that grandparent. Yeah. Have you had this a big grief in your life yet? I don't think so. No, probably not. Because it would come to your, you'd be, oh yeah, yeah, my grandmother. Or yeah, yeah. Uh, so when that person dies, yeah, I'll let you know. Mind. Hey, <laughs> guess what, Sean? Sean? I guess what I am? The yeah. Funeral. <laughs> but so we go super dark, and I love it personally because I think too that soon. yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of too soon, uh, there's a stand-up comedian, Michael Allen. His character is Goat versus Fish. I interviewed him last May, and I need to get this podcast up, but his friend Ron was a mountaineer that got lost on some mountain in Tibet or something like that, and this was in the period of time when they had been declared lost, but hadn't been declared dead, and I interviewed him about his friend. Whoo, man, and of course, you know, we've become great friends since then Mm -hmm. it's almost like i've become his substitute ron on some level but that that freshness and and that uncertainty was just such a different thing to explore Mm -hmm. uh because you know because i've I've interviewed people where it's even been a couple years since this person died but Mm -hmm. they're able Mm -hmm. to kind of Mm -hmm. recapture some Mm -hmm. of the uh some of what's happened but being in the flux of it i mean my fantasy and i hated to say it like this but would it be to find to be the person that people go to to talk about this when their loved one mm. goes. Like a grief counselor? Like a grief counselor, but because we're performers putting it on, out there. Because mm-hmm. I think the thing that's super well, powerful. Yeah, cathartic, cathartic for people. Yeah, because I think that's the thing that's super powerful about podcasts is like they have the possibility of being super intimate. Mm-hmm. Like it's just me and you sitting in your you know, bedroom slash living room mm-hmm. um, having this conversation. And we have the opportunity to be as vulnerable as we want because we're not guarding ourselves for some corporate advertising or whatever. And I think as performers, it's almost our job to like to to blaze the trail for others and say, hey, it's okay to feel this. You're not alone. You're not alone. You know, I'm brave enough to talk about my father's death here on this podcast. But you know, mm-hmm. but but I think it's true. And I think also as performers, we almost need an audience mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. to be able to explore those ideas or those feelings yeah. more eloquently. And Lord knows the more connection we can have interpersonal, the better Yeah, in this day and age. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, this is why I was insisting on coming out here mm-hmm. because I was like, well, first off, I got to get out of the house. University Dan. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I, I, I imagine you'll call, you'll call or whatever, text me a couple of days and go like, I don't know what happened. It didn't record. <laughs> that happened to me a month ago. I had the best interview, this woman at Sundance that I met at Sundance. She lives in New York. She had stories about hanging out with Al Pacino, wow. De Niro. We're driving around uh, Salt Lake. None of it was recorded. Uh, Maybe looking, I can Skype with her. I'm looking, I'm looking at this. I'm going, okay, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm seeing the frame um, count on there. I'm going to... End it there. Yeah, great. Amazing. Perfect. Thanks again. Thank this you. Was delightful. Yes, absolutely. And any other thing you need that Ameri- you're doing? American Grief Cast. Yeah. Uh, you can follow me on El, El Hump is my socials. Uh, I'm sure I got be having fucking mics. Oh, I'm gonna be on Mystic Mondays on Monday, but this is probably not gonna yeah. be before then. I don't know. We'll see. But yeah. Well, always good to plug Mystic Mondays. Yes. Yeah, so have you been another long running yeah, yeah. indie show? Not not since it was at iOS. Yes, right? But just because I have conflicts, not for any other reason. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I just got invited on, so I'll go and... I love those guys. Yeah. I used to improvise with John Holman and uh, Jeff. Linneman. Yeah. Yeah, I... And I know Rick, too. Yeah, I know, I know Rick. I mean, guy. obviously, when he went through his thing. Yeah. Um, 
but I, I was on briefly on the pterodactyl. Oh, you yeah. were? Yeah. Oh, cool. When John Daly was our coach. Really? Yeah. <laughs> So, so you guys must have been wacky as hell uh, when you performed. I mean, you know, with Hall, John Daly yes. as your coach. Oh, it was crazy. I he think... is so funny. He's the first thing I ever saw at UCB ever. Cracked oh, out. Shit. Him and Fuck Brent Gelman yeah. in New York. And Horatio Sands came on. Speaking of two Oh, was this during a DCM? Has Benny Bin Laden. No, it was a random night. Oh, and Horatio my God. Sands came out as a guest. And Reggie Watts was doing was the doing beats. The D Holy shit! For John Daly and Brett Gelman. And fucking Sam. Horatio Sand shows up as, as uh, Osama Bin Laden's wealthy son playing tennis, joking uh, about 9-11. I, like, like, man, 9-11 was I shit. tell you, you saw, you said that was your first show? First thing I ever saw at UCB. And that, I was like, I gotta come back and do be this. a part of yeah, whatever. This is. Yeah. Fucking, that's the way I felt I, when I saw John Daly for, I mean, uh, Andrew, Andrew. And ironically, that, what I saw is the furthest thing from, What's like, happening Harold. Yeah, night. exactly. It's so crazy when it rings your bell like Offensive that. Offensive and, yeah. Oh, you know, they, the reason they had to stop doing Cracked Out is because Paul Mooney, who was Richard Pryor's writer. Yeah, I know funny, who he is. He told from them. The Hell Show he, they, they made a video of him watching these kids, watching Cracked Out, and he's like, these guys are doing blackface. They, you know, were they? Well, he was accusing them of appropriation. Yeah. So they shut it down. Appropriation. Yeah. Because they're rapping. Yeah. But the fact that they called their duo cracked out, he was saying that's insulting to people that are out there that have real addictions and these white boys. Wow. Yeah. So he I'm shut them down. Paul Mooney. He shut them down. I mean, yeah, it's it's tough because late Paul Mooney is very self righteous. I find I found lots of things he said funny oh, and poignant. I love him. I have I have two, his two albums, Masterpiece mm -hmm. and Race. They are he does fucking thirty minutes on OJ at the height of the OJ trial, and it's too soon. It's the best thing you. have I ever guess heard. that just brings us back to comedy being subjective, subjective. and everyone's going to be offended by something yeah and it's, it has to be timely. If he does it at the right time and the place, you can get away with it. Yeah, but then. Five years later, it doesn't age well. And there's other times where you shouldn't make a joke. Like Howard Stern, I think, made a joke about a plane crash. Like, oh, yeah. As it happened. As it was happening. Way before 9-11. I'll tell you he this. he got took off the air. I'll tell you this, though. He's doing better than all of us. He sure so whatever is. he did, but, you know. But does he feel whole inside? That's what I want to know. I think for the team. We really enjoy each other's company because yeah. we can't stop. Yeah, it's true. You're just about, I'm going to ah, stop yeah. it just in case... It. It short circuits the recording yeah, yeah. because it's too long in a file. Fair but enough. But we'll have to do a part two. Okay. And then maybe if one of us dies from the coronavirus, we'll have this. We can go on your grief fast. <laughs> we'll also have this record. Perfect. It's like people looking back on this time period saying, like, listen to these guys joking about coronavirus. Little did they know it kills one half of the world's population. population. But they didn't, for some reason, they didn't get affected by it. <laughs> that's my, that's my. <laughs> All right. Peace out, podcast world. Appropriation. Uh, wow. How long did we go?